Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow panelists, and the chair of the panel, Mr. John Battersby and his wife, Denise, who hardly ever gets a mention. And today, I'm going to mention Denise because I know that she's always where John is. Denise, where are you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when Freddie Matthews gave me a call, um, and this is how organized she is, as, e sorry, he is as early as June last year, I was overwhelmed at the opportunity to talk about Nelson Mandela. And when I asked what is it that I must talk about, I was told the session today is memories of Mandela. And I had to look back and say, what is it that I remember about Nelson Mandela? In summary, to me, this is how I got to know the man, if I may put it that way, Dr. Nelson Kholishasha Mandela, through education, something that he was passionate about, and he was the first member in his family, actually, to go to school. And so he said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. I'll explain to you where I'm getting at. And these are some of the things that inspired me about what he had to say about education. He said, education is a great engine for personal development. He said, it is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can, be hand, can become the head of the mine, and that the child of a farm worker can become the president of a great nation. He also said, it is what we make out of what we have, not what we are given, that separates one person from another. And so the first time I met Nelson Mandela was when I was being awarded the Nelson Mandela Scholarship to come and study for my MBA here in the UK. He was a tall man, and my hands are big, but they were tiny compared to his hands. So he shook my hand, and he said to each of us, you are my ambassador. He said, you carry my name. And I must tell you, from that day, my life changed. My life changed because as I was growing up, as, as, as most of us would have been, watching television, watching all the American movies, I had imagined that my career would be that of being in corporate, sitting in boardrooms, doing the American thing. But when Nelson Mandela touched my hand, I changed immediately. From that day, I said, whatever I will do in life will have to do with something that will allow me to do something for my country. So from that day, I went about on a quest to say, and I spoke to the land and the ocean of the United Kingdom when I left that year, and I said, I am coming back. And when I come back, I will come back in the role of representing my country. And so it happened. That is why today I'm the country head for Brand South Africa. It was Nelson Mandela that changed me on the day that he touched my hand. And so what was, what was the criteria for being a Nelson Mandela scholarship? One, we had to come from previously disadvantaged backgrounds and we had to have proven skills of academic excellence we, but we, we had to also demonstrate leadership qualities and be involved in community development. And I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, you'll agree that these were some of the characteristics among the many that Nelson Mandela had. So we had to, to, be the, to, to, up, to, to epitomize what he was about. And so if you've been given a scholarship with this criteria, it becomes your own purpose. It becomes your own uh, journey. As you go through life, you are always checking, am I, but now because we are, we are no longer that previous, that disadvantage, but the question that one always asks oneself is, am I plowing back to those who are disadvantaged? Am I contributing to others' uh, uh, academic excellence? And am I demonstrating the leadership qualities that Mandela did? I am a Christian, and the two questions I always ask myself when I'm in a very tight situation is, uh, what would Jesus have done, number one? 
And number two, I say, what would Mandela have done? <laughs> And so, again, in whatever capacity and in whatever um, role that I'm in, I always make sure that as an individual, I, I, I develop communities. And so, it was the fact that Utatu Nelson Mandela said to us, we are his ambassadors that drove us. So from the day that he touched my hand, I've always known that I am his ambassador and that wherever I am, I should do what Nelson Mandela would have done. It also came at a cost because when we were studying here in the UK and not having been exposed to the UK system of education, it was difficult. And as we were about to give up, we used to be told, Nelson Mandela scholars don't fail. And so, because you have the advantage of parks in the UK, one would take a walk in the park and try to crack the assignments and the essays. But we, thank, we are thankful that through that hard work and that dedication and that spirit of resilience, we're able to make it. And as I was reflecting about his life, it's funny that there's this Shakespeare uh, theme that is going on here without having been planned. But I, I, I went to Shakespeare, you know where he talks about the world being a stage. And I said in my reflections of, of Nelson Mandela, and I think Shakespeare missed two stages, which I'm going to add. Before infancy, we are born. And after old age, we die, don't we? So I think we have nine stages instead of seven. But I'm sure the rest of the panel members are going to reflect on the stages probably from one to six or one to five. But because of time constraints, let me reflect on the stages that I met Tatu Nelson Mandela in. So I met him. For the first time here, sorry it's a bit blurred, that is a photo of a photo, I asked my mother, because these photos are at home in, in the Eastern Cape where I was born, so yesterday I asked my mother to please send, to take photos of what is in the walls at home. So this is the first time I met Nelson Mandela and this figure that's standing tall, he had such a presence, you could not help but be drawn into him and he had such an aura and this was when he was awarding me the scholarship. Um, so he was standing tall, and for me, he was in one of these stages. You could either say middle age, um, standing tall, as it were. And the funny thing, on the day that I met him, he spoke to me in Afrikaans. And because of my skin, my, my being light skin, and he thought that I was of a colored descent. <laughs> but then again, I understood that it's because of who he is, because he once said that, you may recall that he once said that, if you talk to a man in a language that he understands, that goes to his head. But if you talk to a man in his language, that goes to his heart. So again, this was in the true spirit of Nelson Mandela, thinking that I'm a colored native from Cape Town, and not knowing that I come from his own village, uh, speaking to me in Afrikaans, which was not my mother tongue. He didn't know that him and I shared the same mother tongue. But then that would, the, the skin color would really be explained by the fact that he himself has got some coisin blood, which I think I have as well. But I mean, he was trying. But so instead of me being offended that he spoke to me in Afrikaans, I embraced it in the context of the fact that he always wanted to reach out to people from the heart point of view versus a head point of view. So here he was standing tall and me being very enthusiastic and grateful and shaking his hand. And this is the handshake that changed me, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of my career. And then later on, years later, um, as the chairperson of the Nelson Mandela uh, Scholarship Alumni Association, I had to thank him on behalf of all the recipients of the Nelson Mandela Scholarship. So this was just me and him on stage. But at this time, he could not walk. So he was sitting on a chair, and whatever you did with him had to be sitting down. And he was already aging, he was already frail. Which brings me back then to the seven ages of man, that each of us go through different stages, and that he had lived his life to the fullest. He had been through all the stages, from this tall man with this stature and aura and presence, to a man who in the later stages of his life could not stand. He had to sit, he, he had to sit down, and he was being frail. 
But for me to have experienced him in all those phases was such an honor and was such a privilege that I, I will always hold very dear to my heart. And then the stage that I, I saw him next after this was when he was lying in state after he had passed on. I was uh, fortunate because uh, people do know how, um, you, you know, the impact that he has made in my life. I was asked to go and speak on radio about the impact he had made, but someone called me from the presidency to say, let me have the opportunity to go and see him uh, lying in state. And let me say, ladies and gentlemen, the picture that I saw from this tall man to this man who was sitting down was a stark contrast. He was very thin, they tried to put makeup on him, but he was this, he, he, he was lying down and he had lost um, all of that. But again, as, as, as I, was, I was reflecting about it, to me, it reminded me that as human beings, we are mere mortals. That as human beings, we are here on earth to go through each of these stages. But it is up to us to what I call LIV, a legacy, which is to live a legacy, or to LEAVE, -E, live a legacy. And I think Mandela did his part in all the stages. I would not be able to comment about the ones from one to, to five, but I've read about them. Even his name, Holy Lhasa, meant troublemaker, but he turned it to be a person that, changed, that, that challenged status quo, a person that did not accept no for the sake of accepting no, a person that was a visionary. So I've drawn inspiration from even all the stages where even when he was a lover, a soldier, you know, there are lessons to be learned about who he was in each of these stages. I've got one minute, John. <laughs> So in that one minute, we've got a big watch here. <laughs> <laughs> so in that one minute that I have, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to share with you the poem by Marianne Williamson, but it was his favorite poem. So when I was a student here in the UK, on cold nights when I was having English breakfast tea or Earl Grey, I would be reading this poem and using it to inspire myself and this is what it says. It goes, a return to love. And it says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us the most. We ask ourselves, who am I to be gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people will not feel insecure around you. We are born to shine. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. And as we are liberated, from our own fears, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>